All right, we've got uh, 20 people lined up, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to start by introducing myself. I'm Neil Thompson. I'm the president of the Canada Beaver Community Association. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is our first uh, online AGM, which is uh, something that people are feeling their way through in terms of how to do that. Um, we're hoping to use a fairly straightforward format. The main issue is around raising questions and voting. Uh, and also raising motion. So there was a guide that uh, I sent out with the, the invitation. i uh, just like to review some of these things here. Uh, so the, the, the main changes for, for running online is, uh, you know, we've got three different ways of, of people um, either voting or wanting to talk or, or making comments. So first is verbally, so you can unmute yourself and, and uh, verbally raise a hand. There's the chat window, which is the a cartoon balloon sort of symbol where you can send a message either to everybody or to anybody on the list. Uh, for your, the record, the person who is the minute taker and will also be recording the votes is Kevin. So you will see his name and the list of people. Uh, in, in the, at the bottom of the chat window, it says send to, uh, and then there's a, a, a drop box that will show you who all the people are there. So you can have a private conversation with other people in, in the meeting if you wish to. Um, or send stuff directly to myself or, or to Kevin. Um, so generally speaking, uh, the last resort, if we had very sensitive uh, uh, votes where people wanted to have everything confidential, um, we will also have the option of using email if you want to send your vote, uh, whether it's to approve a motion or to vote for somebody who's for election, is to send it to an email address we set up explicitly for this, which is vote at canadabeaverbrook.ca. Um, and, and so that should allow us all the options to do so. This is a group, uh, 35 people registered. We have 21 people on board so far. Um, so that should be quite manageable doing it this way. Uh, anybody have any questions at this point? Neil, it's Kevin. Um, as, as Neil mentioned, and hopefully everybody can hear me, um, I'm going to be taking the minutes for the meeting. And I'll just state for the record at this point that a, a quorum is established uh, for votes and whatnot in that there are more members of the public or more members of the community than, uh, than directors. So uh, we're good that way. All right, without further ado, let's uh, get the slideshow going. All right, so the agenda for this evening is we have two, uh, shall we say, partners uh, with, with uh, us this evening. One is the Western Ottawa Resource Center, uh, the, sorry, the Western Ottawa Community Resource Center, um, and they'll be doing a presentation, which I have sitting ready to go. Um, also, we have Abby uh, and Jennifer from the Ottawa Public Library, and they will be doing some speaking to that. Um, we'll be covering off the President's Report, which are all the activities in the past year. Uh, Treasurer's report and outlook. Um, there's been some interesting developments in my conversations with the city. I've been talking to some of the staff uh, in the recreation department and have some more information in terms of how they're looking to do um, cleaning and uh, uh, more of the details about reopening, which have some substantial or financial implications. Um, one of the big things we've been focusing on, particularly as we have some time to do so, is to look at renovations which are long overdue in the community center. Uh, we have a couple of uh, projects. Uh, well, I, I put them under Green Beaver Brook because Sustain Ottawa or Sustain uh, Canada and is, is getting a lot of use, but uh, Rob McCauley will be talking to our neighborhoods program and the progress to date. Um, I'll also be doing an update on the uh, Club Link and uh, golf course issue. Um, delegated to me by Jeff McGowan because uh, uh, he, he had a golf date, I think. Um, anyway, uh, plus uh, election of the officers and uh, new people who wish to come on board, either as a director or a volunteer. So going to be fairly straightforward, but there is a, there is a, a certain amount of uh, material to cover off here. So I'm going to pull up the presentation um, for Michelle from... That's great. Thank you so much for inviting us to attend. And I also just want to acknowledge that one of our community development workers, Maria Frias, is also uh, online here with me this evening. So 
Um, I welcome her to chime in at any point um, within this. So uh, uh, people may not be aware, but um, as the Executive Director of Western Alberta Community Resource Centre, I'm just coming up to one year with the organization. Uh, so have been learning lots about the community and the work that we've done. It's been sort of part of the work I've been involved in community-based organizations for a very long time and many of the kinds of programs that we offer at Western Alberta Community Resource Centre, uh, but certainly having to then jump into where we have responded to with the COVID-19 and the pandemic and uh, work with our team to transform our services to virtually everything, like many programs uh, across the city, to online telephone supports uh, has certainly been a learning experience for us all. So I appreciate the opportunity to come speak to you today. Um, so just to the next slide, I just wanted to remind people, um, do I have control? Oh, you do, okay, great, thanks Neil. Um, that the uh, Western Ottawa Community Resource Centre serves one of the largest catchment areas of the community health and resource centres in the city, including uh, a significant part of Nepean, Goldburn, Canada, and out to West Carleton. Uh, so that mix of the rural, uh, or rural and ur suburban uh, type populations. And we have always served a wide range from uh, infants all the way up to seniors and a whole wide range of programming uh, in between. Generally, uh, when we're not in the pandemic, we are have a very busy site location at uh, Two McNeil Court, uh, another location in Nepean, and certainly then our Chrysalis House Shelter, uh, also in uh, Canada, uh, are all very busy. When the pandemic hit, within about 48 hours, we had moved to many of our programs and services uh, being able to be offered virtually. And uh, by the end of the first week, all of our programs and services had moved into virtual supports uh, available to the community. So if you just could go to the next slide. And what that meant for us is that we were able to um, begin offering uh, telephone and our video-based crisis intervention, uh, also available for crisis counseling, our programs for women who experience gender-based violence all went online. We implemented for all of the individuals that we had been in regular contact with for programs and services, regular phone check-ins, just to make sure that we were able to touch base with people and that some of our clients who are the most vulnerable were getting connected to the programs and services that they need. Uh, we had continued with the telephone support for navigating systems and received a lot of phone calls about the various and rapidly evolving uh, benefits, programs, supports that were available in the first couple of weeks of the pandemic. And we moved into being able to do food and supplies deliveries. Uh, we reduced our transportation from being available for just about any need that um, uh, individual seniors and those who had uh, physical disabilities who needed some additional support with transportation for their various social events, uh, appointments, um, medical appointments, getting to church, going grocery shopping. We moved those and reduced those to medically necessary transportation services to both protect the health and well-being of our clients, but also our volunteers and our staff. Uh, continue to develop virtual programming and services and have continued to post a whole wide range of online resources. If I could just have the next slide. So what that has meant specifically for us, uh, particularly around one of our most busy programs, uh, has been around food security. So with, we had our Meals on Wheels program that had been doing uh, daily uh, hot meal deliveries with our number of our volunteers. We were no longer able to do the hot meal deliveries for lots of logistical reasons and instead uh, moved to frozen meal delivery twice per week. Um, we've also implemented, which was a new service for us, grocery order delivery once per week. So particularly for us um, in some of our more rural communities that did not have the delivery services available that some of the urban settings have had, uh, this was really critical for vulnerable, isolated community members who needed additional support. 
With our frozen meal deliveries, we've had a fee associated with the cost of meals, but we've had lots of uh, donations as well as grants available that have allowed us to subsidize that so that we can ensure that no one who needs meal support is left without. I can have the next slide, please. In addition to the, um, the Meals on Wheels and the grocery food delivery, we recognize that people have had a fair bit of, some people have been significantly impacted, and so we've been also doing gift card food and gas deliveries, uh, so people uh, who are really struggling who may not have enough money to uh, pay for their food uh, have had gift cards available, and again, this is available to any vulnerable or isolated community members. And we've had food hampers available for delivery uh, on a weekly basis as well. And again, available to any vulnerable or isolated community members. Our food service programs have been some of the busiest, where we have had uh, up to uh, 800 deliveries of a combination of all of those activities on a weekly basis. Uh, we have four full-time drivers who've been providing that support. One of the things that we did with COVID-19 and the pandemic is because of the risk uh, for particularly older adults, and the average age of our volunteers is in the older demographic of, of seniors and retired people, is that we pulled back all of our volunteers and moved to paid staff delivering these programs, where we had had a mix before of both paid staff uh, and volunteer drivers. We've also had a number of other staff who we have uh, not has where some of our programs went virtual, it meant that we weren't doing full-time hours in programming, and so some of those staff have been also redeployed to help us deliver on these services. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, some of our virtual programming has been um, uh, counseling and crisis intervention through our counseling services, and that has been available <coughs> from, uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays until 4.30, and we've kept our we, uh, Wednesday evening programs. Again, these have been quite popular and busy with some new clients, but also lots of existing clients. Our groups for our youth have moved online, and um, we are doing those through Zoom, and are getting uh, quite a good drop-in response from our cross, our cross our catchment area. The dates and times for all of these programs and services are regularly updated on our website because we're constantly evolving uh, the programs. So we've added, we have like some mindfulness programs uh, for both uh, adults and for children and for, the, and for teens. We've got um, group programs that are running in our Violence Against Women program and we've moved that all online. We also have our virtual caregiver support program for individuals caring for someone with living with dementia. And we have been delivering care packages uh, for caregiver support, uh, information uh, to help with activities for people who are living with dementia. And for um, uh, many of these individuals, the video has not been appropriate, but we have been doing telephone calls. And about four weeks ago, we started with virtual programming, including virtual exercises and activities and programs. If I can have the next slide, please. Um, probably our most active uh, program that has been uh, incredibly popular online has been our Early On Child and Family Center program. It's also allowed us, for example, in our in-person programs, we typically have to limit access to the programs to about 20 children and their caregivers. With the online programming, it's unlimited numbers of individuals who can sign up for um, our drop-in programs and story time and circle time, uh, we have limitations on a, on a virtual show and tell just to allow young children enough time to be able to talk and share their um, objects, whatever they want to show and tell. Um, but the virtual programming has meant that we have been able to accommodate you know, 60 to 70 to 80 families at a given time during circle time. And our workshops that we have been providing for adults only have become so popular that parents and uh, caregivers have asked us to make sure that when we go back to in-person service or able to offer in-person services again, that we're able to continue with the virtual programming because it's added a lot of value to them. So all the places that you can connect on are early on programming. If I could see the next page, please. 
One of the services that has continued to ensure that we're doing in-person services is our is Chrysalis House, our shelter for self-identified women who have experienced uh, violence in the homes. And this service has kept up with a great deal of activity and phone calls uh, and uh, women coming uh, into shelter. Uh, and our, it's continued to offer a crisis line 24 hours a day and we've continued to operate as normal, obviously with the precautions that we've needed to put in with COVID-19 with uh, requiring for screening and uh, self-isolation for women when they've been coming into shelter uh, initially. I can see the next slide, please. So in terms of our next steps, we um, I prefer to talk about the evolution of our services rather than reopening because we actually, as you can tell, have not actually been closed. We've been as busy as we've ever been and some programs have been busier than others. Um, uh, but uh, all programs have continued to deliver services and uh, respond to people who are looking for support. Uh, the typical supports you know, related to mental health, uh, income, um, uh, getting access to food, uh, just figuring out what is and isn't available to them in the community. Um, and as we look at evolving our services, we are participating with the other community health and resource centers and have a survey available uh, online on our website uh, to get feedback from our clients. It's available in French and English and Arabic and hopefully Mandarin soon. Um, we uh, do not have a timeline for when we will be uh, delivering in-person services again. Uh, for most of our programs, we are still waiting for the go-ahead from the province, particularly um, with regards to our early year programming, and we anticipate that our supports for individuals with dementia will be quite some um, sometime down the road, given the increased risk for individuals uh, over the age of 70 with COVID-19. We have our volunteers starting to join in our programming again. And um, based on the feedback that we've already been starting to receive from clients, staff, and volunteers, we will continue with our virtual programming alongside in-person programming whenever that begins again. But we've had really positive response from the availability of that virtual programming and we'll, we'll continue it even as we're able to offer in-person services. So that's how we have been adapting, transforming. Um, uh, we often have new programs and services and always update uh, on our website as we uh, respond to the request for feedback for program delivery from our clients. And I just want to highlight uh, that uh, next year, uh, we will be celebrating 35 years in the community. And uh, so look forward to celebrating that with you and hopefully we'll be able to do that in person at that point. So if there's any, I know that you've got a tight agenda, but if there are questions, uh, you can certainly uh, email us at uh, info at Western Ottawa at wrcrc.ca and uh, we'll happily respond or if there's time, I'm happy to take any questions now, but I know you've got a packed agenda. Thank you. Any questions now? No? Nia, yeah, that's Kevin. I just suggest, um, <clears throat> This is uh, quite a range of programs that could be made available to KBCA uh, people, and um, <clears throat> perhaps we could have a link to their uh, their site on our uh, on our uh, on our web page. Well, let's put it this way: certainly, we're, we're going to be putting up a AGM page, and we can certainly put up a, a Western Ottawa Community Resource Center page uh, on ours that has some and and you know. Well, let's work together to pull together, you know, what's a, a one-page summary that you would like to see on our website, so directing people somewhere else. You know what, Neil, I can, I can, um, we do actually have a nice one-page summary that we have been providing, for example, to a number of our elected officials to be able to offer to their constituents, and I will email it to you because it, there is a nice one-page summary about everything that we offer so that people can get connected to it. I'm looking for something with the links because if it's a document, the chance. Well, yeah, you know, it has it has all the links to it that you can click. Okay, very good. Uh, Neil Jenna here. If I could just make a a quick comment, uh, I just wanted to extend uh, my thanks to Michelle, to Maria, and to the entire team at the Western Ottawa Community Resource Center. Um, I think that above and beyond what they do in, on a normal day-to-day -day basis, 
the way that they've gone uh, out to the community, how they've been serving the community right now and pivoting during COVID has really been remarkable. And I know they're making a huge impact and I just wanted to acknowledge that I know that's not easy, uh, but they're really doing an incredible job and incredible service for our community. Thank you very much, Jenna. We appreciate the support and, and uh, uh, you know, donors have been remarkable. Um, the partnership that the city has pulled together around the Human Needs Task Force to make sure that we're working collectively, not just as one organization, but as a system as a whole has really been something astounding to be part of. Yeah. Okay, very good, thank you. All right, so uh, at this point, uh, Abby, you wanted to have a few words, uh, you're on. All right, can everybody hear me? Yes, potentially. My laptop has kind of been acting up during these Zoom meetings, so hopefully you can all hear me. Um, so I do not have a presentation. Um, we are just going to uh, give you a brief summary about what the library is doing right now. Uh, so my name is Abby Clark. I'm a community outreach librarian at the Beaverbrook uh, Library, just off Campo. Um, I'm also joined today by my coordinator, Jennifer Evans. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having us. <laughs> yes, yes, we're very happy to come and talk to you uh, about some of the things that we're doing. Uh, so we're just here to give you a, just a brief idea of some of the services that the Ottawa Public Library is still offering to keep everybody reading and learning and just connected right now. Um, so although our branches are closed right now, um, or most of our branches are closed right now uh, to the public, we offer a wide range of online services that the public can actually access from home. Um, so this is including things like we have a isolation recreation blog and an isolation recreation for kids uh, portal, uh, which offers fun activities, it offers reading suggestions, other sort of boredom buster activities uh, to help our community uh, really during their time at home. Um, so as of the 15th, uh, kids can also register for this year's TD Summer Reading Club online, uh, where they can track their reading, they can look at all the books that they've been going through during the summer. Um, the Ottawa Public Library will be hosting a weekly schedule of online programming. Uh, so this includes craft afternoons, uh, D and D sessions in our summer program. Uh, we call this Summerland. So through our website, the public can also download their favorite books electronically onto their devices. Uh, we have materials for all ages: uh, English, French, as well as a few other languages. Um, those who are not yet members but who are kind of looking to join in can also sign up for a temporary library card. Uh, they can do this by either visiting our website or calling the library directly. Uh, so right now at our branches, we're accepting returns again uh, at six open locations across the city, much to the relief of everybody who's had our books for about three months now. <laughs> um, as of Monday, we also have allowed the public to make appointments to come pick up the holds that they've been anxiously awaiting. Uh, we also uh, do have certain hours of operation, which is when people can return their items or um, make those appointments to pick up their holds. Right now, our overnight return boxes are closed, so if you or your community, community members uh, want to know uh, what our hours of operations are, you can check the website or just let me know and I can send you that info directly. Um, a lot of people want to know where they can place new holds or come in to browse the collection. Um, when our branches are closed on March, when our branches were closed on March 16th, uh, there were half a million items checked out, uh, which is obviously a, a ton, and about 14,000 items on hold for customers. So right now our goal is to provide a way for the public to return their borrowed items and to pick up the backlog of holds in a way that ensures the safety of both staff and public. Um, when we've got a handle on those, there's going to be an announcement about placing new holds on new items, um, which will be very exciting. Uh, of course, we'll, be, we'll eagerly await uh, new announcements from the province and from the City of Ottawa about when the public can come back to their community libraries. Uh, we're already planning on how we can make that a safe experience for everybody. I think it's safe to assume that we will gradually be reintroducing services over time. We really can't wait to see everybody again in our public. Um, the library is there for the use of the community, and we're really looking forward to getting back to that and seeing old faces, new faces. Um, whenever we're able. So that's basically what we've got going on. Um, does anybody have any questions about the library, about what we're doing? Yes, Petra Friedrichsen, I have a question, Abby. Yeah. 
Um, what are you going to do about the library book club that uh, meets on the first Thursday of the month? Uh, if the second wave hits us in September and uh, we cannot meet in the library, are there any online provisions? So I do know that there have been um, some online options. I think Jennifer might be a little bit more familiar with this than I. Um, so Jen, if you have any insight. Yeah, yeah. my understanding is that the, um, the book club is meeting online, is meeting virtually um, as possible. Um, so the, uh, the lead of that um, book club, I believe her name is Margaret, is uh, heading up the online Zoom meetings um, for the book club. Um, we don't have the go-ahead yet from the provincial uh, government to have uh, in-person programs um, due to the restrictions on the number of uh, individuals in a gathering. Um, also, at the moment, our meeting rooms, which is where the book club would normally meet, is actually being used to quarantine all of the current items. So when those items come back into the library, we quarantine them for um, up to 72 hours, and uh, or up to, sorry, five days, a minimum of 72 hours. Um, so for the time being, the place where people are used to gathering in our library is used to uh, house all those um, returned items. So, um, but certainly when we are able to have in-person programming again, there will be lots of communication about that because we know how vital that is to the community. Yeah, Jennifer, I'm um, interested that the library provides for an online meeting and that not individuals outside the library have to organize that because after all, it's a library program, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a library program. It's run by volunteers in the community. Um, and so we facilitate in terms of, you know, um, providing the space and things like that. Um, so yeah, the will, moment, yes, will yeah. you provide online space? I think so, that would be my question. Yeah, yeah. so right now um, the branch staff is very much um, focused and has been asked to focus on providing um, the curbside returns and the holds pickup service. And during this time, while branch staff are focused on that, our um, central program development department is looking after all of the system-wide programming. Um, so they will be creating, my understanding is, um, an online book club for any members of the City of Ottawa to attend. Um, but for the branch-based programming, uh, my understanding is that right now it's still being um, run by volunteers. And if there's an online component, such as Zoom, a monthly Zoom meeting, um, then that's still being overseen by our volunteers, which we're really appreciative for. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Welcome. Thanks, Petra. Any other questions? Okay, thanks very much. Um, and uh, now we'll turn to our regularly scheduled programming. All right. So um, we split the uh, president's report up into two pieces. Um, as has uh, happened since January. There's there's other information you want to cover off under 2020. Um, so a key activity for the KVCA has been working, uh, you know, uh, diligently with the golf course issue um, and, and a large part of the work in, in 2019 was transitioning it from being a subset of the KBCA or a subcommittee of the KBCA to an independent community association. Um, part of that was to replace myself as chair of that group as well because being a chair of two organizations is a bit, 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 uh, bit of work. and. Uh, uh, so that uh, they are now fully incorporated, uh, separate bank accounts, separate everything. Uh, Kevin McCarthy is a representative who is on the board of the KGPC for the KBCA. Um, and uh, those activities are, are happening independently. It, it took a, you know, we're still heavily involved. Uh, so is Peter Chapman, who is on the, on the line as a Beaverbrook resident, who is the treasurer of that group. So the KBCA is certainly uh, staying on top of what's going on there. Um, we have a new coordinator, uh, Laura Hoag. Uh, Laura has joined us and has a great deal of experience with doing renovations and organizing uh, community centers and things like it. So she has run with the ball and will have lots of information. Unfortunately, she's now traveling to see her mother-in-law, uh, and she may be listening in on the phone, uh, but she was unable to do her presentation tonight. Uh, renovation, uh, we did quite a few things in 2019 to prepare to do renovations. Um, we had an asbestos study done on the, uh, the community center. Uh, we were fortunate to find that the only uh, evidence of asbestos was in the ancient linoleum floor tiles, which we can address by just covering them over as opposed to removing them, and the possibility of some in the drywall mud on the drywall in the walls. So there's some minimal sort of effort, but certainly no more than any other home in Beaverbrook. 
Uh, we've done a lot of planning and we have some initial projects which we will talk about uh, later in the discussion. A um, couple of green activities, uh, the Sustain Canada North the kickoff, which was an effort we've done with the uh, Ottawa Biosphere Echo City Group, who has uh, quite a few members, including the ex-chair here in the community. Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, uh, Rob McCauley will talk about the neighborhoods and the tree inventory program. Other activities we did in 2019 is we worked with other community associations in Canada North to do an all-candidates meeting for the federal uh, election. Um, uh, Yours truly did the annual heritage uh, walking tour of Beaverbrook, uh, which uh, continues to be popular, except this year, of course, or maybe a virtual tour, but that's about it. Uh, there were some last loose ends, which uh, Genesuds was certainly uh, instrumental in working with uh, the community to get some last uh, items sorted out for Penfield, uh, which uh, through the 230 KV line. Now, we're very fortunate that Tom Jackson, who worked with us in the past, came out of retirement or was asked to come out of retirement by the Hydro One board to help get that solved. Um, we've had very light activity in the planning aspects. Um, the only thing that's come up recently has been the 1131-1151 Terran, which is at the uh, pinch point between Terran Road and March Road. Uh, that was actually sold to a development team in Montreal who uh, specializes in apartment buildings uh, as opposed to condos or sell and flip. Uh, they manage the buildings they build. Um, they put in for a rezoning change, uh, which was to use the first floor for commercial activities such as doctor offices or something else. Uh, it would be too small for something like a shopper's drug mart, and it's certainly not a location uh, where you would want to start a restaurant. Um, they're still in the middle of getting some technical details. They, uh, we have been working with the Bethune condo, uh, the people uh, from the condo had some concerns about the revised design for particularly the taller building. Uh, there has been some good discussions going back and forth and those are still being negotiated. So this has not come to uh, planning council yet for the rezoning, uh, but a lot of the details of some of the site plan have also been moving forward. So that's, it's going, I guess the question is, is how viable that building or that property is post COVID. Uh, the last item is its official plan time with the City of Ottawa. It's five years after the last uh, revision, which I participated in. Um, I'm actively working with or re-engaged with the Federation of Community Association, which is about 45 different community associations across the city. Um, they have a very active planning group. Um, so I, we're involved in that. And at, at this point, I am the sole voice from outside the Greenbelt, which is... Uh, as I'm finding out that the uh, the actions the city is talking about inside and outside the green belt are two very very different aspects. Um, 2020 uh, COVID comes to visit. Um, so some of the early activities we did is we talked with uh, K Dubé and the Canada Seniors Council, um, and we expressed uh, concern and asked you know how many people do they have they been able to reach to find out if there's any unwanted uh, sorry, any any demands, any need for help, and they said, well, there's only like a quarter of our people have registered with an email address or anything electronic. Um, she was, uh, they were very concerned about using their phone numbers to contact people, so what the KBCA agreed to do, and we went ahead and spent $620-odd doing a postcard mailer to 497 people in, in and around Canada. Uh, to ask if they needed help. Um, we got some responses. Um, we didn't actually get any requests for help, which is, I guess, a good sign, because certainly uh, we did have some phone calls back saying that, yes, people had received those those cards and were, were grateful that somebody was looking out for it. Um, it just, <laughs> the funny thing is the stamps were the most expensive part. Uh, what else is new? Um, uh, in keeping with best practices, uh, I've been talking with community associations across the city, and there's a lot of interesting activity going on there. Um, uh, one of them is uh, uh, a food bank uh, delivery application. Uh, this got kicked off by a, uh, a group in Manor Park. Uh, they're doing delivery with the Ottawa Food Bank um, to Vanier and in the area and around Mar Manor Park. Um, and through various technical connections, I got involved um, and glued them in with in 
in Anit Live, who is one of Terry Matthews' uh, uh, startup companies in the Canada North BIA. And they are currently working together to automate the standard food bank application, which is called Live to Feed, so that it automates all the routing and everything for people who uh, uh, are looking to, or well, food banks are wanting to do door-to-door -door delivery, which right now is an extremely uh, difficult uh, and manual process. Um, they did that, that consortium as applied to the city and got a grant under the IPP uh, program. So, so that's been going quite well. Uh, we've also been talking to the Canada Food Government. They're going to be the second pilot for this project. Uh, so that's moving ahead, and hopefully that will make uh, home deliveries of, of food. Now, certainly one of the things that was mentioned um, is that the Canada Food Bank had, you know, they were anticipating a big surge. Uh, one of the things they said is that there was a surge, but once the CRB checks started coming out, the, the demand dropped down to about half the increase they were expecting. But their concern is that they're going to get hit when the CRB do, uh, cancels out. So, you know, we're involved with stuff, and we put ourselves up as a sponsor organization, the KBCA as a community association, and to fulfill the needs for the grant from, from the City of Ottawa. So, so that's moving forward quite interesting to follow along with that. I'm also working with the FCA. We've set up a separate working group to talk about best practices. Um, there's two or three organizations have set up a phone-based volunteer uh, versus ask. In other words, if you need help, give us a call. If you want to volunteer, give us a call. So they've set up a couple of phone-based uh, support systems, and they found that uh, uh, they're getting some good response. Uh, they are people in their neighborhoods that they did reach who did need assistance. They're helping about 30 or 40 families in one particular community. Um, so, so one of this is to share across all the community associations best practices in terms of uh, being effective. Um, the, the second aspect of COVID-19 is the KBCA uh, and the Community Center Impact. Um, later in this discussion, we'll have um, uh, the uh, financial impact report, and uh, we're starting to talk with the city, who's starting to get uh, information from the provincial government in terms of opening up the community center, or reopening it, rather. Um, a lot of the issues are similar to opening up daycare, uh, you know, so there's cleaning costs, there's safety, equipment costs, and there's staffing costs, and social distancing. So there's a whole series of aspects to it. So that's just starting to get going. As usual, we're also looking to fill some slots, both at the director level. We're looking for a treasurer, have been for two or three years. Um, there, I, I don't know which what's rarer for community associations to find, uh, a, a Yeti or, or, or a treasurer. Um, I'm, I'm betting the Yeti's easier to find. We're also looking for a communications director, and plus we're looking for uh, community volunteers uh, for community in community events. And, and what we're looking to do, I would say, as, as a target is come September, is to arrange some uh, COVID-compatible street parties so that people can uh, get out and meet their neighbor with uh, in a safe manner, and uh, KBC will be more than happy to sponsor that. Any questions at this point? All right, so again, volunteers, uh, we're looking for all sorts of people to assist. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff can be done virtually, so, you know, uh, don't feel that uh, you know, this has to be contact. Certainly one of the things we want to do is stay connected with um, the schools uh, and the parents in the schools, uh, houses of worship, local organizations, other community associations. We've always got need for, you know, people to assist with web uh, events. Uh, cleanup day is something we didn't do because, again, it was a, uh, social distancing thing. There's no reason we can't do that, possibly in the fall. And that always takes people to help run. So at this point, I'd uh, like to ask for a motion. So first time here to vote. Um, uh, could we have someone to motion and to uh, second uh, to accept the president's report? I propose the motion. Peter. Looks like in second. Sec second is uh, Tony. Uh, I'll, I'll make this simple. Um, all those against? <laughs> yeah. E either either raise it verbally, or if you would uh, put your vote in the chat window. Yeah. 
All right, if there was against, uh, then uh, I'll declare that accepted. All right, so let's uh, look at the treasurer's report. Um, as people may or may not be aware, um, we get sponsored by the city of Ottawa. They give us a what they call a renewable recreation grant, which is an operational funding grant to run the community center. The community center is a building that was originally part of uh, KBCA uh, as a community association that then moved to, and I'm sure Mariano, I know as the call will know all this stuff inside out. It uh, went to the city of Canada and then was sold to the developer of the mall, which is Dave McKean and company. And the city now leases it and pays for the heating and cooling. <clears throat> and in addition to help run, to, to run it, it's delegated to the KBCA for which we get approximately $25,000 a year. Now, it costs the KBCA about $36,000 a year to run it before we break even. So we need about $10,000 on top of the $25,000 in terms of rental revenue for us to break even. Uh, most of our costs are, are, are cleaning plus the coordinator function. Um, so as a result, we have increased the utilization of the community center, partially, uh, certainly credit to the, the community uh, community center coordinators over the last three or four years who've been out there uh, talking to groups and, and finding out their needs and our income has gone up. So we have money in the bank, uh, about $71,000. And now that's accumulated over 50 years. Um, but uh, it's money that we need to use to do renovations because the city does not, uh, us, is not uh, at this point prepared to hand us cash. Um, there is a program for a capital grant for recreation, which we did apply to in February. Um, but unfortunately, that has all been put on hold because of COVID. So we're going to need to proceed in, in the near future to use uh, strictly the KBCA cash to go forward. So, so that's the cash on hand. That's an increase of about $20,000 from last year. Uh, if we look at uh, 2019 actuals and 2020 budget, uh, this is something we also need to, to apply to get our, our grant renewed. Um, basically, what we have, if you look across here, uh, you see that um, our revenue, our budget for 2019 for uh, facility rental was 20,000. We actually made 27,000. So we're seeing a year-over-year -year increase in that. <coughs> and and we've got uh, some fairly substantial amounts that were earmarked pre-COVID. Now building leasehold improvements for 2020, we've got $25,000, and we have another community projects one that's 8,000 and community events. So we've got, you know, $35,000 there that we were earmarking for uh, spending either in community or on the community center. Um, and the fact that it shows uh, a negative is says of, of $13,000 of a loss for 2020 was anticipating that we would be dipping into our cash to to assist paying for that. So um, that's the report. It has been reviewed by our past treasurer, uh, Tony Van Telligen. So, so all this stuff has been uh, reviewed. It, it's also something that the city of Ottawa reviews as part of their uh, giving us the grant. So at this point, could I have uh, uh, an approval of a motion and seconder for accepting the treasurer's report? I'll move it. Mary Ann. I'll second. Peter. All those opposed? All right, carried. Anybody who wants to anonymously say yes or no, uh, feel free to do so through the vote at canadabeaverbrook.ca. All right, now we get into the interesting aspect. So in talking with uh, Brenda Deneau, who was earlier on, on the uh, meeting here, Brenda is reports into uh, the recreation department, and uh, we've been having discussions about possibly supporting um, one of the uh, one of our former clients, uh, which is the Main Street uh, Community Services, which deals with a, a autistic and uh, mentally uh, delayed development uh, teens to, to young adults in terms of additional space for them in the, in the next couple of months. So that started a discussion in terms of what it would take to open the community center, uh, or reopen it rather, uh, during COVID. So um, 
basically the discussions, and, and they're at a very preliminary stage, uh, but certainly the description that Brenda provided in terms of what the cleaning requirements, which would be uh, doing much more thorough cleaning every night, and cleanings between uh, groups uh, using the community center on the day, and restricting uh, groups to one of the t one, one one floor and only one floor, and the floor has to have washrooms. Fortunately, in the community center, we have washrooms on on each of the two floors. H uh, however, in, in looking at the cleaning costs, the cleaning costs uh, constitute about it, it, our annual budget is is about thirty six thousand dollars for expenses. That includes insurance and all sorts of other things, of which the materials and uh, labor for cleaning, which is done under contract, is about $16,000, which you can see here. Uh, the, and, and looking at the current cleaning costs uh, versus what would be required for uh, COVID reopening, uh, it would run to two or 300% of the current cleaning costs. And given at least initially, you're gonna have a lot of groups who may not have enough people who wish to uh, participate in at events at the community center. So looking at a substantial increase in cleaning costs and a substantial drop in revenue, um, if you look at on an annual basis, um, you'll see that uh, we quickly move into uh, a very negative uh, cash flow situation on an annual basis. So if we take the worst scenario, uh, in other words, today um, we were on tap for 2020 to have a net income after all expenses of $18,000 at the end of the year. Um, uh, and 50%, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't matter at that point. But if we move over, if it's twice as, you know, if cleaning cost is twice, then at the end of a year, we're in the red to $13,000. And if it's three times, we're in the red to almost $30,000. And, and at that point, there really is some questions that get raised as to, do we really want to burn through all the uh, community centers cash, which is also the cash for the community association. Um, you know, questions we really can't answer at this point. It's too early, but this, this is an indication of the kind of imposition uh, that COVID will have. This is not inconsistent with what we've been hearing from uh, the daycare industry, uh, who has said that you know they're having to hire more staff, more distancing, fewer clients, uh, PPE costs, and cleaning costs. So. To some extent, some of this uh, raises the question, plus we don't know what, uh, how the city is going to resolve this uh, for both our community center and uh, other community association run community centers. Uh, it's not sure how that's going to play out. But that's, this is very early days, but this was a stab at the kind of impact. Uh, taking that a step further, if we said, you know, we basically stopped operation and closed on April the 6th. Um, so we said, okay, let's look out the remainder of 2020, so we split our costs starting with our cash uh, of $70,000. It's costing us right now closed about $5,000, um, uh, $1,000 a month. So we would be running till September 1st, $1,000 a month. That will cost us $5,000. Um, now the city still owes the KBCA half of our grant for 2020. They paid, uh, they've already paid uh, uh, $12,000, we have another 12000 so uh, if you look at opening, uh, reopening on September the 1st, uh, we would end up in either a slightly positive or slightly negative at the end of 2020, but at the end, by the end of 2021, we're going to have gone through a substantial amount of money. So the $70,000, we've down to $35,000 after uh, uh, 16 months of operation. So that basically says if we <laughs> if we kept open, uh, and even with the city providing us with with their $25,000 a year grant, um, we would be broke somewhere around mid 2022. So so there's some really substantial questions about how to proceed. Uh, yeah, I have a suggestion on this. Uh, yeah. We have the same things happening at our church hall. So we have in the summer. I have had a contract with the daycare center to do their school age program there. And what we've been able to work out because the changes and by getting permission from the diocese to the churches, our church is not going to open until September. Uh, we are reducing their rent because they'll have fewer children, but they are taking over all of the requirements for the cleaning. 
because they will be the only people using that building. And if you have in the summer just one major tenant using it, I think if you you could get what we felt we were doing is it's a community service as well when you're dealing with people that are vulnerable like that. And on that basis, as long as they took over, and that would reduce your costs significantly if they took over, and they still have to follow the same rules that the province sets down, uh, that you could, in fact, let that one group come in. I wouldn't say anything more than that and have it closed for anybody else. It's just one idea that you could look at. Well, actually, funny you should say that, because the Main Street Community Services, they're already, because they have an entrance on the Beaverbrook Mall that's outside, so it's it's not within the mall, they, they have still been open, and they're gradually reopening, and they requested to come and, uh, you know, use the whole community center so they could do physical distancing, and they did offer to do all the cleaning, because they have to do that anyway. So, yeah. so that's, I think that's one group I think is possible until September. And then I think you have to wait and see what's happening later on before making a final decision. I would leave it with the new board to actually make that decision because I don't think the AGM can do that right now. But it is difficult, but I think we have to try to service the community as well and you have to sort of balance those two. Yeah, no, you're taking the words out of my mouth. Um, uh, uh, you, you must be my straight man tonight because that's exactly what we're going to recommend is that <laughs> this is early information. Uh, and we feel between what we were proposing to spend on renovations and or opening or whatever else, we're not in a position to make a decision tonight. But you could do that summer rental, that one summer rental. Well, part of this is, is also getting the benediction from the city. So the city at this point, uh, they're, they're, they're basically saying we're, uh, all the community centers are now closed. Um, we have been talking, and, and certainly Jen has been part of the conversation in talking with uh, the recreation and the uh, child services uh, at the city. So so we're, we're, we're working through what is possible in terms of opening up for this special group so that, you know, they're using it until we get the formal reopening. So this is, like I said, it's early days, but considering it's the AGM, I wanted to raise, you know, here's the kind of issues we're having to think about. I could send you the conditions the diocese said that the care center had to meet in order to be, for us to get approval to let them be in there which may be helpful things about insurance and various things that you might find useful. I'll send that just to you confidentially. Yeah, no, that's very useful. Uh, I suspect uh, certainly my discussions with Brenda to know is that the city will be specifying a lot of those conditions uh, that the KBCA would need to manage and, and or at least oversee, which is something we've done in the past. So, but like I said, it's, it, it's early days um, and, and exactly what the cleaning requirements are it's coming out in little bits and pieces from the province, and there's not quite a fit. It's not quite complete. So uh, I'm speculating in terms of the costs, uh, and perhaps it won't be as bad as we think it is. So thanks for that. So uh, KBC renovations. Uh, again, Laura Hogue has joined us to do that. Uh, we've created an overall uh, renovation plan, which we shared with the city capital grants program because that was part of our application for a $20,000 renovation project. Um, uh, Laura has worked with the directors for budget and prioritizing the project. Uh, there's been a lot of work on that front in terms of getting quotes on the various aspects. Uh, we have also sought out an interior designer um, who has done and completed the design, which you'll see some of the material tonight, and all of that stuff will be available online. Um, it, actually, it looks like uh, you know, it's, it's basically some of the goals you'll see in, in a minute or two. Uh, one of the projects we were able to finish uh, by May, uh, which was done just after the COVID closure, is we now have a uh, storage room on the first floor, um, which is available uh, with you know, steel shelving, um, and also in there a lockable cage, uh, which is something that was sought after by uh, quite a few organizations uh, because nowhere else in the city, and certainly not at the city uh, community centers uh, that they run themselves, uh, do people have a storage. So we've got a couple of, uh, we've got three different groups who all are servicing children in terms of mums and tots drop-in or uh, a French uh, uh, children's program and, uh, and a couple of uh, uh, groups that deal with autistic uh, adults and uh, and, and they all have a lot of stuff. So that is now formally done. Um, it's looking a heck of a lot better than the pile of junk that was in there before. So that was completed. 
and we're going to look to do cost recovery over that with uh, charging our, our tenants uh, a nominal cost, which is about 40% of what they would pay in a commercial uh, setting. So the plans we're looking at uh, is predominantly we need to freshen up the community center. It's been 50 plus years. Um, the intent is to bring it up to a 2020 version of the original. We're not looking at any structural major issues because there's all sorts of problems with uh, grandfathering, etc. The second really start making structural changes. Um, one of the key things is to put in consistent, durable, and cost-effective uh, fixtures and finishes so that it's a freshened up place where uh, uh, it doesn't look like a, a rundown 1965 uh, location. Um, so one of the, the, the big pieces to start with, which was the project we actually applied for the capital grant, is to upgrade the electrical. Uh, we have uh, a number of new circuits we have to put in for various purposes. Uh, certainly if we're renovating the kitchen, we're going to have to put more circuits in. We've had problems on the second floor where large groups have had events with all kinds of stuff plugged in that kept blowing fuses and, and circuit breakers. Uh, two of the projects that will immediately get benefit from that is to replace the side door. Um, it's rather beaten up and it has a very wheelchair nonics uh, friendly sill. So the intent is to replace that and put a ramp and give it a, an accessible uh, push button, which requires its own circuit. Uh, when the uh, elevator project was done about 2015, uh, uh, there was supposed to be an, a, a wheelchair accessible door uh, actuator on the door leading from the elevator in the uh, second floor into the second floor main room and lo and behold they run out of money <laughs> so it was never put in so we're looking to rectify that as well and and also to replace uh, lighting with led on off that is a project that we haven't we have not completed uh, quotation or planning for that but that's the intent uh, one is to reduce the electrical cost and the other one is to make it much brighter with variable lighting Uh, so I give you some idea, and this is the work that was done by the interior designer. So we have a storage room. As you can see here, there's the rough layout. Uh, we're ordering a complete new set of tables and chairs because the current ones are either failing or falling apart and scraping the floor. The tables are all rather beaten up. They're something that's used every day. And the intent here is that we will also be buying some <coughs> racks or, or dollies for both the chairs and the tables that will be on both the second and first floor so people aren't having to carry things up and down because those things do tend to get used fairly heavily. Uh, we're going to be putting in a baby changing table in the washroom on the first floor, uh, completely refresh the lighting, flooring, paint and trim. Uh, we're going to have storage cupboards for the folding chairs and tables. And the former washroom, which is in the corner in the top left, uh, we're going to put in as a kitchenette and cleanup room so that art classes, etc., have a nice big sink for cleanup and also for child-friendly activities where you've got to wash toys, etc. So nothing really dramatic here, um, but to clean it up and and uh, and put in stuff that people are looking for. The second floor, um, we'll see a number of different things. So a complete refresh, uh, including the window fixtures against the west wall, which is uh, we'll get a lot of light from that side, but it can be overwhelming at times, and certainly the art classes want to be able to uh, contain or, or modify the lighting from there, and also uh, it gets very hot in there if it's a summer day about 2 or 3 o'clock and the sun's screaming in. So again, this will see uh, a boardroom will be refurbished to be much more flexible. Uh, new furniture, we're going to get rid of the big ugly table, uh, put it in a... Uh, a large screen TV, which you can get for about 200 bucks used from people. Uh, the washrooms and sinks need to be refurbished. Again, they haven't been touched. Now, the city did come in and replace all the toilets in 2019 because there was a few issues. Um, corridor new blinds, uh, convert the servery um, to a much leaded cloakroom. And, and the lounge needs, you know, the carpet needs to get ripped out. The furniture is falling apart. Uh, it needs better lighting. And we need to... Uh, uh, clean up the fireplace and possibly put in a visual uh, electric fireplace uh, to make it uh, a little more useful. So, so nothing really radical, uh, but things that should be an improvement across the board. Um, again, in terms of the style of materials, etc., um, it'll be a replacement with the up, let's call it the flooring that is replaceable, maintainable. Um, 
uh, and looks good and feels good. Uh, certainly we've got clients uh, like the Wine Dancers who need something that's got a bit of bounce to it as opposed to hard concrete. Uh, furniture, we need some durable furniture, particularly in the lounge. Uh, plus we're looking at some color schemes uh, such as what you see here. And that was the work that was provided by a local uh, interior design firm who also lives in Beaver Road. So looking at uh, a couple of items we have, detailed budgets. Uh, the first one is, as I said, the work that was looking at the electrical subpanel and infrastructure. Uh, that was a project we submitted to the city as a capital uh, grant uh, piece that, uh, again, is has been put on the shelf. So we are looking to potentially do that on our own because uh, who knows when the city is going to have money again. Uh, we have also costed out uh, the cost of the ch chairs and table and storage carts, and that's about uh, 13564 So the total of those two projects together um, would be $32,825, uh, which given that we have $70,000 uh, in cash is, is, is something that's well within our budget or within our cash capabilities, and but that's a pre-2020 COVID assumption. So what we'd like to do is propose a, a couple of motions here. One is to accept the renovation plan and the 2020 budget items, the last two which I showed, but with the proviso to say we're going to withhold going ahead until a meeting later this year, while well, we will do the same thing as we're doing tonight, and uh, basically look for approval from the community to go ahead with those items or not. So we're not sure at this point. There's nothing critical about some of the items we've looked at for renovation that they have to go ahead or we're going to lose money or we made a deposit or something. Um, but what we're looking for at this point is uh, an agreement that the things we're focusing on is the right plan and the right kind of changes to upgrade it and, and make it viable for the next at least 25 years. So could I have... Uh, Someone motion this, please. I move that we accept the renovation plan in 2020 budget. It's Rob here. As well as the second item, if I can move both of those at the same time. Uh, I'll just speak briefly to the, the second item. It's basically, as, said, as, as Marianne said, we're, we're talking uh, about the COVID-19 uh, activity in terms of reopening and how we would do that, how we would fund it. Uh, we don't really know enough at this point to know one way or another how we would get organized and what the financial impact is. Uh, I'm going to guess that's going to be sometime towards the end of the summer before we have a much clearer picture. So I would like to ask that, uh, uh, as, as has been said here, we put a motion to reconvene, uh, uh, if you will, a second AGM-like meeting in that it's a community uh, uh, a point for the community to express its support or not uh, and, and, and put that on the table now. Can we have a seconder for the two motions, please? Okay, Peter, I'm happy to, I'm pleased to second both motions. Peter Chapman. So anybody opposed to doing nothing right now and making the decision later? I'm not seeing anything in the chat, so thank you for that. Um, so Green Beaver Bro. So um, there's a couple of things that have gone on here. One is sustained Canada North. Um, this is a re- Let's, let's call it a reincarnated version of what uh, Julie Gurley so competently did uh, three, four years ago. Uh, that got shut down because the program that she was working under, which was not funded by the KPCA, was funded by a separate organization, uh, got shut down. Uh, the Ottawa Biosphere Ecology Ottawa, or Robeck, uh, approached us last year to kick off a similar program, and we held a kickoff meeting in October. Unfortunately, uh, we were all ready to roll and start uh, getting those programs going. Uh, there was about a half a dozen that were uh, prospects, which we're going to get volunteers and geared up for, had to be postponed. Um, so uh, from that standpoint, uh, uh, you know, we're just going to put that out a year and, and, and go with that. So 
Uh, the second part of that, which uh, Rob is going to speak to, um, and Rob, do you want me to make you the presenter? Neighbor Woods in Neighborbrook. This is a project we've been working on for the last, uh, this will be the fourth year of doing tree inventory work within, uh, within Neighborbrook. of photos. You may have seen the street signs that we use when we when we're in the middle of doing the inventory. I'll give you some background and, and purpose. Some of this will be um, you will have seen this information before in a couple of previous years. Uh, the bottom line is we love our trees here in Beaverbrook. So Neighborwoods is is one of the long standing um, multi-year projects. Uh, to address the urban forest and how can how can we sustain and and improve upon the forest that we uh, that we share here in Beaverbrook. Uh, when we started, the overall forest status was unknown. We were losing a lot of trees to the emerald ash borer, uh, but we really didn't know what we had in terms of species or health or uh, or even the uh, the age factors. A lot of the trees were planted in the 60s when the homes were being occupied in the first place here, so they're coming mature at this point in time, reaching end of life, and uh, not a week goes by that we, we don't hear a chainsaw somewhere around having to remove a tree that's, that's reached its end of life. And uh, we don't have enough younger trees coming along yet to replace those, so uh, we have a strong level of community interest in renewing the forest uh, and also the, the recognition that trees mitigate pollution and contribute to, uh, to the climate change challenge. So the purpose really of, be of, uh, of neighborhoods is to establish a baseline by giving us an inventory from which we can then manage the improvement plan. So this inventory will show the species diversity, age and condition, and uh, the positioning, where are all these trees located? And in the process, we'll foster a community stewardship and educational uh, approach. And this, this stewardship and education happens really at the, at the individual homeowner level, gaining familiarity with the, the health of their trees and also at the community level, at the aggregate level, the big picture view of what do we have across the whole of Beaverbrook. And then they, we're, we're in the throes of putting together the gathering the information so that we can then build a uh, forest management plan in concert with the urban forest management plan that the city has, has put in place. So the neighborhood's approach uh, Neighborwoods is a, an initiative that was started at the University of Toronto and it's a community-based urban forest inventory protocol developed for use by lay people which gives the tools to people like you and I to assess in a consistent comprehensive and scientific way the condition of trees and the, the location the size and all various 31 odd different criteria that we measure. So over the last three years we've hosted a training course in May or June and then worked through the season into September um, to gather a bunch of data which I'll, I'll show you in a minute here. Uh, some of that data. So since the last AGM we worked through the 2019 season inventorying two clusters or, or blocks if you will. Uh, Milne and Barley is a block um, and then Tiffany and Leacock totaling 1100 trees and about 140 houses. Uh, that was about 600 volunteer hours to do last year. We've had some tremendous assistance with the, the committed volunteers with this project. We also hosted a panel discussion on tree selection and planting because that's an area that uh, homeowners want to become more knowledgeable about. 
And we partnered with a variety of environmental groups, including the Sustain group that Neil mentioned earlier. Ottawa has uh, a wide variety of environmental groups, including a lot of the uh, parts of or the or all of the uh, various community associations. We also work for the City of Ottawa Forestry Department and the good work they're doing on tree planting. Uh, we were we recommend different planting sites to help them with their decision making, and they've helped to diversify the species mix in Beaverbrook. You you probably noticed some of the the different the new trees that are being introduced. And uh, we've been actually helping other groups, other community associations plan for starting your own tree inventory. There are three groups that would have started this year had we not uh, been hit by COVID. So that's good. It's, a, it's sort of an organic growth that we're starting to see. So this is a map of Beaverbrook. The orange line is the perimeter of Beaverbrook. And the green uh, sections are what we did the first couple of years. Those little dots represent trees. And this map can be looked at in some detail at the tree by tree level to see what the uh, description is for each tree based on the data we captured. The blue lines identify what we did last year, the two clusters. So where are we here? So some data. So this summarizes the number of houses, the number of trees that we've uh, inventoried so far. So it's a couple thousand trees, 2,200 trees, over 90 species, but I think 96 at last count, unique tree species. Um, some of those are just ones and twos, but it still shows there's variety, uh, a wide variety across the neighborhood. <clears throat> we also identify plantable spots and then help to make suggestions to homeowners should they want uh, want our opinion on what to plant where. This is an example of some of the data that we are now able to collect and analyze based on our, our 2,200 trees. So you probably can't see the detail here, but on the right-hand side, the blue is represents the family the spruce family of trees. The red is maple and the green is pine. So at the family level, as it states in the bottom here, 57% of the trees fall into those three groups, which is a little bit too much of a good thing. So knowing that, we can help to encourage people not to put any more white spruce in or maybe not so much sugar maples. Let's think of something else to diversify. We saw the, the effect of the ash trees being hit with, with the ash borer, we'd hate to see something like that happen to our maples. So we're gathering more data like that, and, and this year we'll be looking at the data. Uh, frankly speaking, the last couple of years we've been too busy gathering, doing the inventory work, but because of this year, COVID has unfortunately constrained our ability to do the training and the door-to-door -door inventory. So um, we actually canceled the course for this year, but we've shifted our focus to improving how we do the work. And that is uh, covered in the second bullet here where the core team of volunteers is working virtually on data management, assessment, some tool development, process improvements, things like identification of um, tree diseases and tests so that we can become more knowledgeable and, and give that information to the homeowners as we, uh, as we move throughout the community. And dendrology aid, aids, that's tree identification aids. And a better, we're looking at some better ways of mapping the GPS locations of each of the trees, um, looking at uh, tools like GPS receivers or, or ArcGIS as a global information system. So those are some of the activities that we're in the throes of doing right now. Uh, we also partnered with the Carleton University last year as a community partner to the environmental science faculty. And what that meant was there was a, uh, a six-person team that came out to learn about neighborhoods from us. 
And with the professor, we identified some deliverables for them to work on as part of their third year uh, project. And then they produced some reports for us that was very useful to us and very useful to them getting that hands-on in the community uh, exposure. So we've got a, we'll be doing that same thing this uh, fall with Carlton. And if possible, we, we still would like to get some tree assessment. Uh, I, I don't think it's going to be possible to do the door-to-door, -door, but we could quite likely work in the parks and do some of the tree identifications of the, of the city trees and parks. So that's as, as, like other things we talked about tonight, we can't really plan much more. It's kind of like week by week with, uh, as, as things open up more. So that's my, my presentation on neighbor, neighborhoods. Are there any questions? Yes, Petra Fredrickson. I have a question for Rob. Um, can you talk to us about green space protection and pesticide use and education? Um, well, green space protection and pesticide use. Uh, it's not an area I'm very familiar with. Um, my focus is really on, on the trees. Um, we are trying to expand into um, invasive species, which might be the only area of overlap that I see to answer your question. Uh, because they are they have a place, I think, if we're trying to battle some of the invasive species that uh, help Canada finds. Did you have a more specific did you have a specific area of interest? Is it um yeah, it's uh, it came to my attention that we had uh, twelve Parks here in um, in Canada, I think in Beaverbrook, who uh, were uh, where there was pesticide use in in the spring, and uh, it sounded to me very excessive um, that invasive species have to be uh, sprayed. And I don't know how long this has been going on in Beaverbrook. <clears throat> I don't know. It's um, it's a question I could take away and get back to you. Um, we have one of our one of our volunteers is. Uh, works for Health Canada in the area of, uh, uh, of invasive species. So I might be able to find something out for you. That would Unless be great. Hi, thank you. Jenna, Jenna says here, I'm, I'm happy to uh, provide a comment on that. Uh, the city does have a program to deal with wild parsnip. Uh, as many would know, wild parsnip is, uh, can be incredibly dangerous uh, if touched. And there is a citywide program in which, as, as you have rightfully said, Petra, there are about uh, 12 parks in Canada or around the parks uh, where wild parsnip is uh, located, where they do treat for this. Uh, when they do this, there's not notices put out in the paper uh, as well as uh, in the park itself. So it is well signed, uh, respecting, I can respect the concern, uh, but definitely, um, you know, better to be rid of it and avoid a situation in which it could seriously harm uh, members of the community. Thank you. Thanks, Petra. I assume you're done, Ron? Rob? Thank you, Neil. Okay, very good. Um, let me take that back. Uh, why am I not? Uh, all right, so we're back to that. Um, actually, uh, there was one question that was raised. Uh, Hillary, you asked about uh, renovations and uh, COVID-19. Uh, implications in terms of hygiene and distancing. Um, actually, the community center, uh, you know, obviously we're going to have more, you know, uh, uh, d dispensing stations. We have um, we have two washrooms and a, a kitchen on the second floor, and we have a large uh, wheelchair accessible washroom on the first floor. Uh, the first floor will also have uh, an additional sink put in and a kitchenette on the first floor. So we're well equipped to actually have 
different groups on two different floors. And the building is actually laid out uh, quite well from a distancing perspective in that there's separate rooms with uh, joining corridors. Um, so actually, uh, there, there doesn't appear to be anything radical we need to do. Uh, obviously, we're going to supplement that and, and check with the station practices. But in, in general, um, you know, uh, there, there doesn't seem to be any uh, critical issues there. Uh, does that answer your question? All right, so if uh, no further response, so I'm going to the... So golf course update. Uh, Jeff McGowan uh, sends his regrets. He uh, was going to present uh, as the co-chair of the uh, Canada uh, KGPC chair, co-chair. Um, it was uh, formed uh, in 2019 as a separate community association. Uh, raised funds, uh, particularly through the gala, which was in January. Uh, a substantial amount of money. It's hired a planner, a professional planner to work with the team, uh, hired a legal team, um, and uh, currently seeking accredited engineering to be experts on planning issues such as stormwater management and hydrology. Um, the KGPC was able to win standing uh, in the court case, uh, which will be very much standing up and supporting the City of Ottawa against Clublink. Uh, this will be in court July 8th, 9th, and 10th, um, and at this point the details are not there, but we're expecting that uh, it will be possible to view it by something like YouTube so that people can, can watch the proceedings but not participate. Um, uh, certainly uh, what uh, I've been asked to stress is that the legal fight is just starting. Um, it's, it's highly likely that uh, you know, there will be a partial or full victory. Um, uh, by the city uh, in terms of the 40% agreement, but knowing how Clublink has worked in the past, particularly with Glen Abbey, they're going to appeal. And every time they appeal or drag the city in front of El, uh, the uh, succeeder to LPAT, the, uh, uh, or sorry, LPAT, which was a secret uh, to the uh, OMB, um, that's going to cost everybody who wants to participate money, and that's not cheap. So, uh, you know, we're certainly looking for donations. Um, they're still trickling in. There's uh, a lot of people who get the message. Uh, and right now there are lawn signs available. Some didn't make it through the winter. And there's now t-shirts. And to provide information on, on where to get that stuff. Um, of course, all of this stuff's available through links on the our Canada Green Space website, including donations by check, by Square, or GoFundMe. Um, uh, there's, there's also a button on the front page to order a sign. There's still only 25 bucks. And there's t-shirts that are now available in kids and adult sizes that are available through uh, actually a, a well-known outfit from in town, Shopify. So, so certainly, uh, you know, the KBCA is supporting it. I've got my t-shirt order going in uh, tonight and I'm looking forward to seeing you out there with it. So uh, last item of the night. And that's, um, we have, these are the current board of directors. Um, and as far as I'm aware, I've not had anybody say that they will no longer be willing to stand. Um, uh, we are certainly still looking for, and you can see the vacant uh, opportunities here. Uh, would anybody like to uh, volunteer or would anybody like to volunteer somebody else for the position, particularly a treasurer? I happen to know there's someone with a little bit of experience that in the audience tonight. So no no volunteers on that front. All right. So in in that case, um, so what we are going to do at this point is we're it's jumped around on me here. Um, so what? Um, uh, at this point, I'm going to ask for a, a motion to acclaim the current KBCA board and officers uh, to carry forward to next year. And I'd like someone to second that, please. Andrew Glenn, I'll second that. Did you get Sorry, for, for the minutes, who was that, please? Andrew Glenn. Thank you, Andrew. Seconder, please. I'm happy.
happy to second Peter Chapman. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, anybody uh, uh, wish to uh, is against uh, approving the slate of board of officers by acclamation? No, that's uh, carried then. So that's what we have for this evening. Any last questions or comments? It's Kevin again. Could I just make one more comment about the golf course issue? Uh, because the uh, this hearing that's coming up the 8th, 9th, and 10th is going to be done online, we went from a proposed two-day uh, hearing, and it's now three days. So whatever we were spending on lawyers is increased by 50%. So that just speaks again to the, uh, the need for... Uh, uh, more donations because that's that's really what's going to drag us down. Uh, Club Link is hoping to wear us down and and outspend us. But we can't let that happen because uh, we have to. We have we've hired our own lawyers because there's often a case where, or I, I won't say there's often a case, but there's a potential case where the needs and desires of the of the of, of our group might not be in concert with the city. Even though the city is, is taking this fight on, we appreciate that. So we have to have a separate council there. So it just means that we're spending a lot more money on these things. And Peter Chapman, as the chairman, can bear that out with how much we spend on uh, lawyers and planners. Sorry, I'm Thanks. the treasurer, the chairman. Just, but yes, uh, we, we've spent uh, a fair chunk of money. I mean, we don't really want to talk too publicly about uh, things, but you, you can understand that uh, this is a, a top-end uh, boutique law firm that specializes in litigation that we've taken on so um you know and you, you can say that basically something like half the money we've raised to date has, has, has been for professional fees of, of a number of people that's spent to date sorry all right well if 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 that's uh the last bit, so uh, meeting adjourned. Thanks for attending. I hope this uh, worked out for everybody.